Buddhists and Christians around the world have entered into dialogue. And as this dialogue has deepened, some of them have taken it within themselves. They have not only studied the beliefs of their dialogue partners, but have gone on voyages of discovery that embrace both Buddhist and Christian spiritual practices. In this series of profiles, we are going to meet some of these explorers and listen to the stories of their inner journeys. My name is Robert Jonas, and uh, we're speaking here in the midst of the Buddhist Christian Conference in Chicago. Very happy to be here, and I'm from Watertown, Massachusetts, and just outside of Boston, where I, uh, I'm married and I have a 25-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son, and um, we, on our property, have a, uh, a retreat center called the Empty Bell, and it's dedicated to the Buddhist Christian dialogue. And um, I'm here to offer some music, some shakuhachi music, and also to meet new friends who have been involved in the dialogue. And uh, I've been involved in the Buddhist Christian dialogue since 1983 at the Naropa Institute meetings. Uh, so uh, it's exciting to be part of this ongoing community. In my daily life at the Empty Bell, in addition to fathering a son who has just discovered baseball, uh, so I'm playing catch a lot, uh, I am a psychotherapist and uh, a spiritual director, and I facilitate um, prayer meetings and meetings of study to study the Christian mystical tradition. And uh, maybe I'll go backwards a bit from that point to talk something about, to say something about my history. I. Uh, I grew up as a Lutheran in mid-Wisconsin, in Wausau, Wisconsin, and my grandparents were Lutheran. They spoke German around the house. My grandmother taught me how to pray. She uh, taught me several prayers. One of them in German is, uh, Ich bin klein, mein Herz ist klein, am Niemen in Wohnen aus Jesus allein. Now that may be what she called Plattdeutsch, but the but the meaning is, uh, that I remember, is I am small, my heart is pure, no one lives in my heart but Jesus alone. And uh, it's, it's almost, it's strange and graced, uh, graceful, I think, in a way that that prayer was returned to me later in my life. And uh, to have Jesus in my heart is, it turns out that my spiritual life has been uh, about all the time, uh, all these many years. But I had many detours. and. Uh, I'll say a few words about that. Uh, I, uh, after high school, went to Luther College to be a Lutheran minister, and I studied for two years. It was during the Vietnam War, 1967, and uh, I decided that religion was not up to handling the conflicts that were going on in the world, especially Vietnam, and that essentially religion was irrelevant. <coughs> and so I transferred to Dartmouth and majored in government at Dartmouth College in 1967. And while I was there, I was uh, searching around for some kind of uh, exercise or sports program. I had always been involved in sports. I was the captain of the football team uh, back in Wisconsin. And so on. so I discovered uh, karate and was immediately attracted to it and started taking taekwondo lessons. And my teacher, uh, which is Korean karate, and my teacher, uh, uh, Donnie Miller was his name, um, was a Taoist trained meditator. So I learned Taoist meditation back in the 60s and we meditated every day before and after our classes. And then we learned that uh, the body is infused with energy called chi or ki. And we were instructed to bring the ki to our feet to warm them while we walked down the snow barefoot in, up in Hanover, New Hampshire. We did that sometimes in the winter, and sometimes it seemed to work, and other, other times my feet just sim simply turned blue. And uh, um, luckily didn't, I didn't damage them, we didn't do it that much, but it was a lesson for me about the, um, the, uh, the depth of spirituality that is available in the world that I never encountered in my Lutheran upbringing. Um, the, uh, that the body is infused with spiritual presence. Uh, I never heard anything about the body in my Lutheran upbringing. 
<coughs> and also that nature is alive. And being in nature, one can um, participate in nature at a spiritual level. That also was not part of my Lutheran upbringing. So I didn't try to make sense out of it at that time. I just went straight east. And I started doing Taoist meditation every day. I went into uh, community organizing work in the inner city of Kansas City and um, was the only white in an all-black housing project. <coughs> and uh, there were drug deals in the apartments next door. Uh, I was on the 13th floor of a city block where there were, I think, 13,000 people in this giant city block. There were big towers, um, 15, 20 story towers, uh, brick and uh, wire structures. And it felt really like being in prison. And uh, so that was my shocking introduction to urban life. And, uh, and also uh, a re-immersion in the Christian tradition because that's where I came back into, um, I walked into a, a Baptist church for the first time, black Baptist church. So I learned how to sing uh, in the spirit with the black folks in Kansas City um, as I was living next door to Mama Bohannon. And Mama Bohannon uh, protected me. Her son, it turns out, was, uh, I think his name was Wayne Bohannon. It's been so many years now, since 1970, um, was the, uh, the leader of the Black Panthers in Kansas City. So when I was accosted by, by blacks on the street, I would just say, well, I'm living with Mama Bohannon and everybody, and then I was cool. So, uh, and I taught uh, meditation to black kids and Italian kids in the inner city of Kansas City in conjunction with karate. They were attracted to karate because they could beat up their friends, but as soon as they got there, I was teaching them to sit and uh, to bring awareness to their breathing. And this is, of course, totally new to them, and I hope um, I left after some time, I think a year and a half, with a few kids that were really turned on to um, spiritual life. Uh, God knows what happened to them. You know, I don't. Uh, I sometimes wonder. I pray for them. But um, my, uh, I left Kansas City and the Vietnam War started to wind down, and I moved to the country. Um, I actually moved to Berkeley for a while after Vista, and I don't know. Uh, uh, you rem may remember Stephen Gaskin in the early 70s and, all the, and the farm in Tennessee. Well, there were a lot of us in, in Oakland and Berkeley who were, um, we, we were living in a Peace Brigade commune, which was taking in draft resistors. <coughs> and uh, some of them were rehabilitated with us and some of them uh, went, uh, lost their minds in LSD and some of them stole our wallets and <laughs> some of them uh, became friends. And so it was, it was an incredibly rich and complicated time. Um, but uh, Stephen Gaskin was around, and I was attracted to the country, so I uh, went with Joanne, the woman I was living with at that, that time. We, uh, first of all, we had a baby at, in Berkeley um, and at home, at, in the commune, and I was there, and uh, it was so exciting and wonderful, and it turns out everything was fine, and Christy is now 25, and, uh, but we started the Berkeley Home Birth Collective. And um, we started delivering babies <laughs> in Berkeley with uh, no training. But we had an intern with us, Bill Gray at that time, who was also a Peace Brigade member. And so we were training ourselves in uh, midwifery, basically, and getting some nursing help. And we started doing prenatal care. <coughs> and uh, so we were really starting an alternate society at that time. And, um, and, and then the Back to the Land movement came. So we went to um, Oregon. And I can't remember the name of the town um, in Oregon, but there was a commune there. In town, somebody was selling a truck. I bought the truck, a 47 Dodge, uh, brought it back to Berkeley, and on the streets of Berkeley, a friend and I built a huge cathedral structure on the back of this truck. And it, we covered it with Leonardo da Vinci paintings. And on the front of the truck, above the cab, was a big circle with uh, the Renaissance man, naked Renaissance man, stretched out just heading into life. And uh, it, it was a wonderful project. It took about five or six months. <coughs> and I was working as an ambulance driver. 
Well, then uh, we, we drove across the country, and I headed east um, with Joanne and Christy. And we settled in uh, New Hampshire. And for five years, I ran an organic vegetable farm and uh, started the uh, helped start the uh, Milford Food Co-op in New Hampshire and the Keene Food Co-op and the Brattleboro Food Co-op. And right today, the Brattleboro Food, food Co-op is a giant. Um, and the um, <coughs> and we convinced the local obstetricians to uh, occasionally come out to home births. And I became the director of the Green Mountain Health Center for a year and a half, where we did east-west medicine. And uh, a totally wild east-west experiment that there is mostly disappeared. There are a few places now where you can get health care that's integrated. Well, actually, the New Age movement is doing a lot of that right now. But I think probably we were one of the first. This was in Brattleboro in 74 and 5, Brattleboro, Verm Vermont. And um, it was an exciting time. I had learned shiatsu, uh, shiatsu uh, massage. And um, I became, I was going through an emotional crisis and um, discovered a monastery called the Common. It's a Carmelite monastery in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Became friends with the, with the monks who were also doing organic farming. And so there, the Back to the Land movement met Christianity again. And for me, it was, it was it was a coming home, but now there was a new dimension of mis mysticism, because, as I was saying earlier, in the Lutheran tradition, we had the, there was the, there was no body and there was no nature. There was there was personal relationship, because there was Jesus. So we had that down. But when I discovered Saint John of the Cross, I discovered the the sensuousness, the eroticism, the the, the tactile sense of being in the world in my body, and that that was part of the spiritual life. Even though eventually, in some ways, um, you um, experience dark night of the senses, still the senses were acknowledged, which is a step, a, a step ahead. And then uh, there was nature in St. John of the Cross, so beautifully described and used in his poetry, his rich symbolic poetry. So, so suddenly my, my Christian life was expanded tremendously and I felt the connection with the East because um, in the letting go that's described in the, the, the dying um, into experience that St. John of the Cross describes, there was the, a sudden connection with Taoist meditation and the simple, um, the simplicity of the moment and, and being present. So East and West came together for me. And I was a third row of the Carmelite for five years or so, quite active in the community. Uh, my wife and I taught natural family planning, which is part of living with the rhythms of nature and so on, growing our own food. And then I uh, entered, we left the country and I went to Harvard to uh, get into education and I was interested in international development. So I entered Harvard in 1978 in the Graduate School of Education. In the midst of my graduate work at Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, my mother died, and this is about 1970, in well, she was sick with cancer in Wisconsin, so I flew back and forth to be with her and to uh, uh, pray with her. She was not a praying woman, but she, she warmed the idea as her death neared. And uh, she was very touched by the music that my brother and I played on guitar, Christian songs for her. And that the shock of that started to move me more deeply into my spiritual life, but also into the psychological world. <coughs> and uh, I discovered that my parents had been alcoholic and that there were a lot of wounds that I carried from the alcoholic household that I was unaware of. And so I went into psychotherapy, and um, that was a really rich experience. It was so rich that it completely changed my life. I mean, I decided that um, I was less interested in changing the world politically and uh, through educational means, and I had a very grand vision. And I was uh, suddenly descended into the territory of intimacy with others. Because in a way, this 
psychotherapist saved my life. And it was a one-on-one -on -one experience. It was eye-to-eye -eye experience. And I don't know if I had ever had anyone pay such close attention to me before. So I discovered the, the, the richness and the healing power of intimacy. And, and uh, I switched my whole program at Harvard around to the doing of psychotherapy. So I changed all my courses. And uh, I began to take training in what's called object relations, uh, which is a subset of the psychoanalytic school, Freudian school. And the wonderful thing about uh, object relations, there are, there are problems with it. There's no spiritual dimension in object relations as it's taught in psychiatric uh, circles. But object relations describes the process of how those people that we grow up with, especially our caretakers, and later in life our mentors, in a way come into us. They become voices within us that we carry. And in a way we carry the history of our past relationships with us into each present moment. And sometimes we're aware of those inner voices and sometimes we're not. And um, thus we have, you know, um, um, difficulties in our present relationships because in a way we're projecting or bringing along our past with us without knowing it. And I, this was a wonderful new territory for me and I got totally into it. Um, and I started analyzing all my family members and all my friends <laughs> and alienating a lot of them um, because I was becoming quite facile with all the labels of what people's problems were. And I, so I'm sure that I misused it at first. And I think probably I also misused it on myself and ended up uh, giving myself every uh, neurotic symptom that exists in the DSM-3, applying it all to myself. Um, but uh, I continued in psychotherapy and doing it. And then I started to do psychotherapy in the early 80s and uh, felt that I possibly had a gift for it, spending that intimate time with people. And uh, in 84, I met Henry Nowen at Harvard when he was teaching and immediately loved this guy. I mean, I just, he's, he's very, he's, he's a charismatic uh, person who, who gets totally bodily energized by the presence of Jesus when he talks about Jesus. And maybe that was some, for me, a resonance back to my love for Billy Graham back in the uh, 50s when I grew up Lutheran, but there, there's Henry, but he's Catholic, so it's a little different, and he's a little bit more mystical than Billy Graham. Um, so I uh, went up to Henry Nowen in 84 after a lecture and said, well, I'd like to take spiritual direction with you because what you're talking about, about Jesus' presence here and now is like what I want, and I don't experience that all the time. And, uh, and he said, well, let's talk, and we did talk, and after a couple of sessions together, uh, we we thought maybe I was noticing, maybe I was noticing something that he needed to notice in his life that he wasn't seeing, and so we started to think, well, maybe I'm supposed to be his therapist instead of he my spiritual director, and we went back and forth there, not quite knowing what this relationship was about, and. We, there was some tension there. We almost lost touch with each other. But then uh, I was working with um, handicapped people at Rentham State School, where I had a psychology internship, and with the staff who worked with handicapped people. And Henry was starting to be connected with the Warsh community of Jean Vanier, um, which is a, a, a spiritual community for handicapped people that is now worldwide. And it has a Christian Catholic base, but th now that spirituality is opening up a bit um, to where there's Protestant and Jewish involvement um, and also a bit of Eastern experiences coming in there too. So we met um, at a time when our interests were quite similar and um, we both needed our friendship and it turned into friendship. So I had this friendship with this Catholic, charismatic, mystical guy, Henry Nowen, that was formative for me. I was in psychotherapy, and simultaneously, <laughs> I met my future. I went through a. Di uh, when my mother died, I started to go through a separation and divorce with my wife Joanne. Extremely painful, um, and as I was coming out of that experience, 
that's death experience. I, I and met him, and I also met um, Joseph Goldstein. He's a Vipassana Buddhist teacher, and uh, and uh, <laughs> this web of relationships that I began to be involved in included psychotherapeutic friends um, and teachers, uh, Christian friends and teachers through Henry's connections, and then the Vipassana community. And uh, one of the people I met was my future wife, Margaret, and it turned out that Margaret's mother, Sarah Durian, is a, was a friend of Joseph Goldstein's and a student and a friend of Joseph Goldstein's. So uh, I began to move also experienced in my own family life um, the Christian Buddhist dimension. So I, um, in 1980s, I spent um, many long days of sitting in silence at the Vipassana Retreat Center in Barrie, Massachusetts, called the Insight Meditation Center. Did several 10-day retreats, a lot of um, three-day retreats, and um, some long courses. And of course, through it all, I'm in feeling the healing that was coming to me in these different dimensions, I, I was noticing that the teachers of, in each of these three worlds, the psychotherapeutic, the Christian, and the Vipassana, had strong opinions about people who were involved in those other dimensions. So the Christians had opinions about Buddhists and had opinions about psychotherapy and how it was generally these were judgmental opinions, not positive ones, <laughs> and, um, and, and vice versa. Uh, but I was feeling in integration in myself um, that was going somewhere. I didn't know where it was going. And so in the early uh, 80s, my story uh, sort of begins to take some form in terms of my public life. I um, started leading retreats that brought these three dimensions of healing together. And I started, re people started coming to me as clients uh, or whatever you call folks who come to other folks, I don't know, for some help, uh, uh, who, who wanted the integration of the psychotherapy and the meditation and the Christian practice with prayer and so on. So I uh, began doing that work at Episcopal, in Episcopal context. My wife is Episcopal. So in, in 1986 or so, I felt inspired to go to theology school, so I did. And I, I had just finished my doctorate at Harvard in 80, 84. Um, and I felt I really needed more training in the, in the Christian tradition, of especially the mystical tradition. So I went to the Western Jesuit School of Theology and began to study the history of Christian spirituality. And um, I had a wonderful time with that. I, I took five years to do it, or six years, with two courses a semester. And I was especially interested to, to explore the, the prayer life of the Christian mystics. And all my papers at Weston were in the dimension of integrating psychotherapy and Christian spirituality. That was my focus. And then I brought that to other people folks started to come to me for spiritual direction. So my practice as a psychotherapist then began to shift even more dramatically um, from just a general integration of all these paths to more and more just the spiritual dimension to the point now where in 1996, um, I'm not taking psychotherapy clients anymore. I'm um, just working with people in spiritual direction. Although all those skills that I had from doing psychotherapy are still there, and um, maybe in a moment we'll talk about how that works with individual people. Um, in, mm, let's see, three years ago, I started the, uh, we moved to Watertown, and I started the uh, Empty Bell Sanctuary, uh, renovated a carriage house in Watertown, just two miles outside of Boston. And this building of the Empty Bell came out of a vision that I had in prayer one morning. And uh, I was in the habit of getting up every morning and uh, praying before the rest of my family got up. And after 
uh, my, my family at that time being a, a, a young boy, Sam and Margaret. And uh, one morning I had a, a really vivid image of sitting on a cushion in a circle of people where I was facilitating people of different spiritual dish traditions to come together and to be in an atmosphere of holiness together. And in this atmosphere, there was um, a very real sense of people supporting each other to then go out and do service in very many different ways, everybody having different ministries. But when we came together, people could feel the sense of supporting one another, even though our spiritual paths were different, even though our spiritual traditions were different, East and West, uh, Protestant and Catholic. Buddhist and Hindu and Christian. And that, that image in prayer was so powerful and deep for me that I had a sense that that was what my life was going to be about. And um, I think that was maybe about five years ago, so it would have been 1980, 1991 or so. And then when we found the property in Watertown and bought it, uh, I bought it very clear focus on that carriage house, that that carriage house was going to become the embodiment of that prayer. And, and it has, and that's what's become the empty bell. So we renovated it, and uh, I'll say a little bit about the program of the empty bell, what happens there now. There's a community of people at the empty bell that comes, and I would say it's uh, maybe 20 or 30 people who are, we think of as the members of the community, and on any given time there might be um, five, ten to fifteen people who come. We meet every Sunday morning, uh, beginning first with uh, uh, silence, sitting on cushions in a circle. And we have uh, a zazen, a period of zazen or contemplative prayer, just silence. Occasionally I'll say a few words in the silence. Um, and then we read the scripture for the day uh, according to the Catholic lectionary. And I'll share a few words, as the leader of the group, I share a few words about a contemplative reading of this, these, uh, these, these scripture uh, writings. And then uh, people share very simply what's coming up in their lives in, con in connection with the scripture or in, in, the, in the immediacy of what's coming up in the silence today. And after the sharing time, we have more silence, and then we pray for others. <coughs> and we support each other to go out and do, um, uh, to have a life of service, basically. So that happens every Sunday, year-round. And then there, uh, there's a similar group, uh, some of the same members on Thursdays. And then on Tuesday evenings, there's a, a group that's studying the history of Christian mysticism. And so we're going into our third year in that group. And uh, we are basically reading some of the texts of about 30 Christian mystics. And right now we're somewhere in the, I think, 14th century, uh, going into the third year. And that's been a wonderful experience to, to just to, to read the texts of these people who were so excited and enlivened about God's real presence. And, but to read it not from the standpoint of a theologian and studying theology in seminary, but to read from the standpoint of the the, um, the inspiration of our own uh, of our own prayer lives. So we read, and then we come back and we sit together. We have silence, and then we bring the texts out and we talk about where we were touched or where our experience is different from this person because of the changing times or whatever. So it's it's letting these. It's a little bit of a resonance with object relations. Um, in object relations, you talk about how you, your parents are inside you, and, and in this case, spiritually, we're talking about how these mystics come inside of us, where the tradition begins to live in us as we're learning it. And uh, so I think that's one of the most exciting projects of the Empty Bell. And then there are many other things that happen. We have um, two or three Tibetan lamas that come in periodically for Christian Buddhist dialogue. We have um, several uh, Buddhist priests, the Zen priests who come in, and um, as yet not so much Vipassana involvement, 
and uh, I'm going to say about that more about that later. But um, the Buddhist Christian dialogue is uh, very much alive there. I mean, anybody, well, lots of folks in the Boston area who are interested in that dialogue come to those sessions, uh, which also happened then as an outreach program for Nancy Bell in churches around the Boston area. And I helped start a program in Brookline, <coughs> Massachusetts, called the Ruach Program, which is an ecumenical context in a church setting, an Episcopal church setting, where every fall and spring we have a 12-week program focused on interfaith issues. Um, this past spring, it was the question of work. What do we do with our work lives if we're Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Jew, uh, Sufi, and, and several others? And then we have panel discussions at the end of each of these series where the teachers from the different traditions can say you know, what we've learned or what differences we've seen, what common ground we've seen. And that has been going on for, I think, mm, I think four years, the Rua program has happened. Um, and then we do several programs in conjunction with the Berry Center for Buddhist Studies, um, which is run by a good friend of ours named Musong, who's a former Cor Korean Zen monk. Um, and Musang and I have done many presentations together in, uh, in Christian Buddhist dialogue. Uh, last year we focused on Meister Eckhart, who's one of my favorites, um, in several retreats, and um, uh, or in two retreats. And then um, we have a group of Buddhist and Christian monks and nuns who come to the Empty Bell quarterly to spend a whole day together. And there are some lay people too, um, although, it's, but it's primarily monastic. And I facilitate these meetings, and it's become a wonderful local support group of Buddhists and Christians to, to come together. And so it's so wonderful because the um, many times monks and nuns have told us that they can talk about certain dimensions of their spiritual life there among people who are quite different than they can in their own monasteries or convents. That we've developed just a real spirit of sharing that's mutually supportive, even given our differences uh, in tradition. And uh, I put out a little newsletter to, keep to help that community keep the conversation going in between our, our quarterly meetings. So that's, um, that's an overview of what the Empty Bell does. During the day, often I um, meet <coughs> Often I meet with people during the day at the Empty Bell. Um, I would say an average of three or four, three people a day maybe, um, sitting one-on-one, -on -one, cushion to cushion, very intimate way, talking about our spiritual lives. Traditionally, that's called spiritual direction or spiritual companionship. And um, so that's part of my ministry. And um, I guess the last thing I want to share is about the writing ministry. I uh, Last year began to feel, well, not last year, I was probably about when I started the Empty Bell, I also felt that I needed to write more about what I was doing. So I finished the, uh, the book, uh, a, a book in March, published by Crossroads Press called Rebecca, A Father's Journey from Grief to Gratitude. And uh, that's just come out, and then I'm working on a book now about the Shakuhachi, which I play. The, uh, uh, bamboo flute from the Japanese uh, Buddhist tradition. Um, and so that will be a book about the shakachi itself and also about music and spirituality, which which is new to me. I feel like an explorer, but I and I, I feel led to write about it and share that with other people. So so that's an overview of my ministry right now. It's uh, one on working with people one on one. It's um, in that intimate work of healing and then um, leading interfaith dialogue groups through the Empty Bell, and then helping Christians learn about their own mystical tradition, um, and then the writing. Well, I'd like to talk <laughs> a little bit about um, some of the interesting dimensions of the Buddhist-Christian dialogue for me, and also the psychotherapeutic dialogue. Um, my primary interest is in people being happy and healed. I mean, that really is what my ministry is about, and I feel that that's what God wants in me. Um, 
in a very imminent way, um, an intimate way. That's what God wants for all people. And um, but but I but there are many sort of issues that come up when one tries to integrate these m very different traditions. And um, maybe I'll just share a few of my thoughts on this. Um, I find, for example, that when I that one of the great gifts from Buddhism to Christianity is to help us Christians be in touch with the lived moment, the present moment. And the moment of, as we all know Zen folks say, now, here now, be here now. And that, that moment, that very precious moment of direct experience is something that Christians have not really known so, so well, I think. And so it's a wonderful teaching. And from the Christians, I think the, um, the Buddhists here at this conference, for example, here in Chicago in 1996, uh, are expressing some thankfulness to Christians to remind them of the, the need for, for engagement in the real world, in the economic, political structures of our world. So that's, these are beautiful sharings. Um, and there are some problems that can come up in this dialogue. Um, in years past, it was always true that when we had Buddhists and Christians together, for ex um, that the the um, the Buddhists would come because they were there to teach the Christians, and the Christians were very happy to receive from the Buddhists. But I've noticed a subtle change over the last even four years now, to where there's a little bit less of that. There's a little bit more sense that some of the Buddhists, anyway, now do want to receive something from the Christians. And there's some interesting sort of conversations that begin to happen right in that territory. Uh, one example would be where we're talking about this, uh, what happens in silence. And we, we say in the Buddhist tradition, um, there is this precious moment of pure presence. And we may say something similar in the Christian tradition. There's a precious moment of pure presence. But I also feel that in the Christian tradition, I have grown with this experience right from the start of my life, my prayer life with my grandmother who taught me how to pray, that there's another one there. There's another one there, a holy one. And for me, that was Jesus and is Jesus. And that when we as Christians say that Jesus lives in us, Christ lives in us, there is always an interpersonal dimension in the spiritual practice. A dimension of, say, an inner voice or a sense of inner presence um, that leads me to make contact with an other in, a, in an ultimate way. And that, when we say the ground of what's ultimately so, is somehow relational. Then when I stand up from prayer or meditation, I am still in the company of that relational sense that something dynamic and relational is going on. That doesn't change. So there's no difference from sitting and praying and standing up and acting with other people. It's a relational universe. I am constituted relationally. But sometimes I feel, for me as a Christian, that some Buddhists have very hard time with this anything that would be um, <coughs> uh, any effort to say that to say anything about what's ultimate and that for many Buddhists and I think maybe for some Christians too but um, the sense of relationality is meant to disappear completely and so in the Christian tradition we call this uh, the apathetic tradition where we go but beyond all concepts and all thoughts and so on, so that any sense of otherness has disappeared. <coughs> and there's just this being and presence, but no, disc no, no uh, other. And uh, sometimes in the Christian tradition, the apophaticists who say you know, that it all collapses into oneness in some way, uh, that can be, of which you can say nothing about, put themselves above the cataphatists, that is, those who who love the rich and storied 
um, images of the life of in the Gospels and the life in music and the life in icons um, and images. <coughs> and so these two folks sometimes can get um, uh, not understanding each other, not meet each other, or try to, in some subtle way, say that their path is maybe a little bit better than the other. And um, so that's, that's one area, I think, where there's a little bit of tension sometimes. Um, but I myself, uh, in myself, don't feel that tension. I, it, it, it is not a problem for me. Um, sometimes I feel <coughs> that what prayer ultimately is about is the simple presence of God in which there, I there, there are moments where there is just, everything is just what it is. And there's no spiritual thought about it, no religious thinking going on. But there's a beauty in just being present to everything just the way it is. It's kind of zen-like. And, and then there are moments when I feel this very, uh, this vivid sense of an intimate presence to me that's infusing, that is the, the, lo the, the, the locus or the the leverage point of everything that's going on, something deeply relational. Um, so maybe maybe one insight I've had gotten from the dialogue is that uh, very often what we're trying to do is maintain a very is is that spiritual practice is the the balancing of these different dimensions and moving quite fluidly sometimes in and out of different dimensions, and that a temptation is to latch on to some dimension of spiritual practice or reality whether it's a psychological, particular psychological dimension or a, an emotional dimension or an iconographic dimension or a, a technique dimension and make that everything to the exclusion of some other um, uh, entry point for God's presence to us. So uh, it is kind of a wonderful dance. Is how I, I how I feel about the spiritual life. 